From Software recently dropped a trailer for Shadow of the Earth Tree, and with the hype train rolling again, why not go back and play one of the most influential video games of all time? Continuing my series of ranking the bosses in the Soul series, today we're ranking the bosses in Dark Souls 1. The same criteria applies. This video is a quality ranking, not a difficulty ranking. These bosses will be ranked based on design, entertainment, and balance. Smaller factors like arena and runback will also be considered. But without wasting any more time, let's get right into the ranking. At the bottom of the list, to the surprise of absolutely nobody, we have the Bed of Chaos. There is nothing I could say about this fight that has not been said already, so for the sake of everyone's time, we're gonna move on. Your experience with the Moonlight Butterfly is dependent on one thing. What build are you running? If you're running a mage build, or just anything with range, then this fight is gonna be a cakewalk. But if you're a pure melee build, then this fight is gonna be a cakewalk. Difference being, you have to wait until the butterfly feeds on the grass or whatever the fuck this is to actually land damage. This boss has a grand total of 5 attacks, and all of them can be dodged with minimal effort. Above the shallow moveset and lack of challenge, this boss is just an absolute snooze fest, where you spend most of your time with your dick in your hands waiting for the butterfly to land. Easily one of the worst bosses in the game. Gwendolyn shares a lot of similarities with the Moonlight Butterfly. They share the same music, they have very similar magic-based movesets, and they're both boring as fuck and spend most of the fight completely out of your reach. This fight can be chalked up to running, smacking Gwendolyn a few times until he teleports, rinse cycle like repeat. There's no challenge, there's no entertaining gimmick, this fight sucks ass and has little to no redeeming qualities. Upon replaying Dark Souls, I was unfortunately reminded how bad the second half of the game is. Tomb of the Giants being one of the game's worst areas, but before you can get to the Tomb of the Giants, you have to go through Pinwheel, who is one of the easiest bosses the series has to offer. The biggest problem with Pinwheel is that most players don't bother with the Catacombs until the late game, so most players just steamroll him. However, even if you go through the Catacombs right after the Asylum, this boss is still a joke. Pinwheel has a very shallow moveset. The only attack of actual threat is the fireball, and that can be dodged with minimal effort. There isn't much else to say. This boss is absolute garbage, and while it may not be the worst boss in the game, it's certainly in the conversation for easiest boss in the game. The Ceaseless Discharge is yet another F-tier boss that's littered in the Demon Ruins. It's basically a revamped fight of the Old Iron King. You wait for the arm slams and attack his arms, or you do what everyone else does and one-shot him by the fog wall. Because fighting him the traditional way is not fun in the slightest. At least you can end the fight quickly, unlike Gwendolyn and the Butterfly. However, even with that, this fight is still absolutely shit. Staying in the Demon Ruins, we have our next boss, the Centipede Demon. This boss mainly suffers from a shallow moveset and poor RNG. If you're unlucky, the Centipede Demon will spend most of his time standing in the middle of a lava puddle taking pot shots at you. But the moment you get the demon on one of the islands, this fight's an absolute breeze. The only thing you should look out for is getting knocked into the lava. Since the area you have to fight him is incredibly small, it's very easy to get knocked off and burned to death. But as long as you manage that, this boss will give you no problems. The Capra Demon is a boss I've warmed up to over the years. It's still a bad fight, don't get me wrong, but I don't think he's as bad as some people say. The dogs are very annoying for sure, and the arena is insanely small, but the staircase makes it easier to create separation. The boss hits pretty hard, but most of his attacks are well telegraphed. This fight is not great, but it does enough things well to put it above the previous bosses. It may be a bullshit fight, but at least it's not boring. The Taurus Demon is just the Capra Demon with the bullshit knocked down a level. Just like the Capra Demon, this fight also has add-ons, but they can be killed before the boss even spawns, and the latter gives you an opportunity for a plunge attack similar to the Asylum Demon. The problems with this fight are, again, the arena. Fighting a massive demon on a super narrow bridge can be quite the challenge, but as long as you time your dodges, you'll kill this demon in no time. For an early game boss, the Taurus Demon is honestly not that bad. From Software is no stranger to reskinning their bosses. Case in point, the tutorial boss in this game is reskinned and fought two separate times, and the worst of those fights is easily the Stray Demon. This boss has three, maybe four attacks, and they are all insanely easy to dodge. He has AoEs, which do hurt a lot, but then again, it's so easy to dodge, it's basically a non-factor. This fight is just not entertaining, and serves us nothing but free souls in the early game. FromSoft had a cool idea with this boss, it just wasn't executed well. Priscilla's invisibility is a cool gimmick at first. Using the snow to find her footprints and track down where she is? That's a really good idea. The problem is when you do find her, she offers little to no resistance. Her attacks don't do a lot of damage, and she's very easy to dodge. And once you figure out how to track her down while she's invisible, you're gonna start tearing through her health bar. This fight had some cool ideas, but it's ultimately brought down by the lack of challenge. Despite being one of the lords, Nito is an absolute pushover. The strategy in this fight is simple. Bait the AoE attacks so Nito kills all the skeletons, then rush in and do some damage. Nito's attacks do hurt, but the problem is that all of his attacks are massively telegraphed. 
Now, this is balanced by the fact that you're being assaulted by an army of skeletons, but as mentioned earlier, all you have to do is wait for Nito to kill all the skeletons for you. Nito's design looks incredible, but unfortunately his fight is underwhelming. You want to know just how fucking bad the demon ruins are? The Asylum Demon Reskin might be the best boss in this area. This fight is just like the tutorial fight, but more health and AoE attacks. What propels this demon over the straight demon is his lore and his really cool fiery retexture. It may be simple, but it still looks good. But those are the only things that this fight has going for it. This boss has a cool design, but it's dragged down by the shallow moveset and lackluster challenge. Simply staying on the dragon's side and smashing the attack button is the most effective strategy, but this boss does have a few attacks to look out for. Mainly, the jump attack and the charge. The charge in particular can one-shot you depending on your level, but as long as you look out for those attacks, this boss will be dead in no time. Also, you can't forget about the dipshit who can buff the dragon and take pot shots at you, but even with that, this fight is not difficult. See, I made it through a gaping dragon segment without making reference to the fact that it looks like a giant puss. The tutorial boss in Dark Souls 1 remains an iconic fight. He may be easy, but I will always hold a soft spot for the tutorial fights in these games. His sheer size and massive swings do a great job at intimidating first-time players, but of course, any veteran of the series is going to make light work of this boss. This fight may be easy, but he does his job at teaching you the mechanics of Dark Souls. Sitting at the end of Sen's Fortress is the Iron Golem. This boss has one thing that I really like, and that's the arena. It is entirely possible to knock this boss off the arena and kill him instantly, however, this applies to you as well. His attacks are slow and easy to dodge, but you're always at risk of an instant death because of the arena, which is a design choice that I actually like. His damage isn't great, and he's super slow, but the extremely narrow arena balances it out. Overall, a solid fight, but it's nothing special. To give this boss some credit, Seif looks incredible. He's one of the coolest looking bosses in the game. His sheer size can be intimidating, however, this fight is not a big challenge. Seif does most of his damage using tail swipes and crystal spells to keep you away from his sides. However, once you wait out these attacks, getting close to Seath and hacking away is rather easy. If Seath had a few more attacks, this fight may have been higher, but the shallow move set and the awful run back is what drags Seath down from a higher rating. Now we're getting into the bosses that are actually pretty good, starting with Sif the Great Grey Wolf. The first thing that I love about this fight is of course the lore. The story of Sif and Artorias is probably the best piece of lore this game has to offer. The fight itself, however, is a lot weaker. Getting under Sif and hacking away is once again the golden rule. He has some sweep attacks to keep you out from under him, but dodging these attacks are rather easy. As long as you stay aggressive, you should be fine. The fight may not be hard, but it's certainly better than some of the other fights in this game. Despite being the final boss of the game, Gwyn has a lot of things holding him back. First off, the runback. This is easily one of the worst runbacks in the entire series. You must run through the Kiln of the First Flame every single time you die. The fight itself is solid, but of course the biggest problem is parrying. If you're even semi-good at parrying, then you're going to absolutely destroy Gwyn. Gwyn is surprisingly quick with some of his attacks, and being an endgame boss, he packs quite the punch. But with that said, it's hard to ignore just how easy he is with parries. It's a solid fight, but unfortunately didn't have the challenge you would expect from a final boss. The Gargoyles are still one of my favorite early game bosses in the entire series. The fight starts off with a single Gargoyle, with a second one dropping in halfway through the fight. This can be super intimidating at first, but the second Gargoyle spawns with half health, which is a balanced choice that I actually really like. I also love the arena. The rooftop being sloped makes it easier to separate these two and dodge its flamethrower attacks. It's an early game boss, but its challenge and design is among the best in the game. Ganks are usually really hard to balance, especially in the early game, but I think FromSoft did a near-perfect job with these guys. Easily one of the best fights in the game. Sitting at the end of possibly the worst area in the game, we have Koilag. This boss specializes in area denial, shooting puddles of lava throughout the arena. In this fight, you need to be cautious of your surroundings, otherwise you're in for a quick death. As long as you're careful with the lava puddles, you should be fine, since Koilag is yet another boss with a very shallow moveset. Some of her attacks do hurt, specifically the AoE, which can one-shot you depending on your vitality. The lava pools and area denial add another layer to this fight that most other bosses don't have, and it's what propels her this high on the list. The Sanctuary Guardian is one of the most underrated fights in the game, and a great way to kick off the DLC. This boss is not only mobile, he has plenty of attacks with difficult tells. On top of that, he has heavy resistances to magic and fire. He has a surprising amount of reach with his melee strikes, and he can shoot lightning bolts at you. They also gave you a massive arena, which I really liked. Sure, there's almost no interesting lore, and his fight seems to come out of nowhere, but when compared to the other fights in this game, the Sanctuary Guardian is actually a very solid fight. 
The four kings are basically a massive DPS rush. If you can do high damage quickly, then you're going to do just fine. But if you can't do high damage quickly, then this fight is among the hardest in the game. This boss spawns multiple kings on timers, meaning if you can't kill the first king fast enough, then you're in for a very difficult fight. The kings all share the same attacks, which include a purple disc that tracks you, an AoE attack, and plenty of sword combos. Not only is the fight hard, this is easily one of the best arenas in the game. Fighting the kings in the pitch darkness of the abyss is cool as shit. This fight has everything you want in an endgame fight. Cool arena, great music, and a great challenge. Cracking the top 4, we have my pick for the best boss in Dark Souls main game. And that title, of course, goes to Ornstein and Smell. Putting aside their legendary difficulty, this duo is a shining example on how to balance a gank fight. Smau's sluggish movements combined with Ornstein's quickness is what makes them perfect complements to each other. The pillars and differing speeds make it easier to create separation and slowly pick one of them off. I also love how you can essentially pick your opponent in the second phase by choosing who to kill first. Now, this is a great fight. However, upon replaying it, this fight has a lot of issues that keep it from a higher ranking. First off, this stupid fucking bullshit. Getting hit by this just feels insanely cheap. Smau getting his fat ass stuck on the pillars also happened more than once, but above all that, I think the fights ahead are just better. And surprise surprise, they're all from the DLC. Dragon bosses in these games are almost always hit or miss. From Software either nails it or completely flunks it. And Calamate is one of the best dragon fights that the series has to offer. The build up to the fight is fantastic. Seeing Calamite fly throughout the royal wood and then seeking assistance from Hawkeye Gao who calmly snipes him out of the sky for you, which then sets up a one-on-one -on -one with the legendary dragon. Calamite has a very large move pool and his attacks do a lot of damage. He has claw swipes, fire breath attacks, and he also has a grab, which I did not know about until this moment. Calamite's lore is on the weaker side, but thankfully his fight makes up for it. This is easily one of the best fights in the game and definitely one of the coolest dragons in the series. The final fight against Manus is probably the most difficult fight in the game. Despite his size, Manus is very agile and his attacks have a very long reach, and even if he creates separation, he has a lunge attack which can close the distance. If his sheer aggression was not enough, he also has magic attacks which do a lot of damage. This boss's very large moveset combined with his aggression is what makes him so difficult. This fight is very hard, but it's also completely balanced. Once you get used to Manus's surprisingly fast movements, the fight becomes a little easier. But even with that in mind, Manus is, in my opinion, the hardest boss the game has to offer. However, he's not the best. That title, of course, goes to Artorius the Abyss Walker. Honestly, you can swap either Manus or Artorius and I'd be fine with it, because these two bosses, to me, are the clear-cut best fights in the game. But Artorius is able to slightly edge out the top spot. Knight Artorius has almost everything going for him. His lore is amazing, his design is great, and his fight is among the best in the game. Artorias has a large array of moves, which include jump attacks and sword combos with various tells. Once you lower his HP enough, he eventually buffs himself, drastically increasing his damage, and when he's around 40% HP, he buffs again. At this point, he can nearly one-shot you if you're not careful. Artorias' sheer damage combined with his agility is what makes this fight so memorable. There is a magic to this fight that I cannot explain. Maybe it's the iconic intro, or Artorius flipping around the arena like a madman, or maybe it's his tragic backstory. Above all else, Knight Artorius checks nearly every box, and is my pick for the best boss in Dark Souls 1. Well, that concludes the ranking. I know I said I was going to rank all the bosses before Shadow of the Earth Tree came out, and it's safe to say that's not happening. Just the idea of playing Dark Souls 2 is enough to deter me from that little mini-project. However, when Shadow of the Earth Tree does release, you can expect a boss ranking there. But until then, I'll see you in the next one.